pray and we'll begin our session tonight. Let's do that. Our Heavenly Father, in the midst of busy lives, it's good for us to take this time apart and to focus our thoughts again upon things eternal and upon your word in particular. And we do pray, Heavenly Lord, that you will come amongst us and help us tonight in a substantial and rich way. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Catherine, do you have my Bible? No. You don't have my Bible. <laughs> well, that's a catastrophe. But we do need remedying. So I'm going to have to borrow one. And uh, there's a beginner's Bible. <laughs> Can I pinch yours? Oh, just take, take my daughter's. That'll be right. Thank you. She knows it all anyway, don't you? <laughs> Wish you did. Well, again, it's good to be together. Sorry about the change in location, but yesterday it was quite exciting around there. And uh, Tony was saying today in his inimitable optimism. <laughs> Praise the Lord, he said. Hi, Andrew. Good to see you. Sorry. Great to see you, man. Grab some notes. Oh, you can't go without those notes. Um, Tony was saying in his inimitable optimism, we needed to see that happen before we put the school buildings on there. He said, I've been telling them we needed to redirect those flood paths. Now we know. <laughs> that's, that's true. So... It's an ill wind that blows no good. Is that right? Isn't it nobody any good? So there were some good things that came from it. Well, tonight we begin the first of two weeks looking at the subject of the Scriptures, Revelation and the Scriptures. Now, I've had a go at putting this in a kind of mechanical layout sort of way for you. Can most of you see that? Not really. Some of you can, Ray can't. You might have to come sit in the front row, Ray. <laughs> it's not... It's all the light. Yeah, it is. Well, we're not going to be able to avoid that because Hans needs the light for the videoing tonight. So we're just going to have to, to put up with that a little bit. Sorry about that. You will find on your notes that I've given you this uh, in, in your layout on your notes anyway, so you'll see that there. In the... W First chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith of the Holy Scriptures, there are about 10 articles in total. Magnificent, full statement, and really too much to look at in one go. So tonight, we're going to look at, as you see in the synopsis on the notes fully, just three main sections of it. Revelation and Scripture, or shall we say the necessity for Scripture. That might be a way of actually describing this first article, the necessity of Scripture. Two, the contents of Scripture. And three, the authority of the Scriptures. For those of you who are not here with us last week, the Westminster Confession of Faith is one of the great Reformation confessions of the Church, prompted by political and ecclesiastical problems in England in the 17th century, and gave birth to this 31 chapter summary of the Christian faith. Now we looked at that, its background and its overall structure last week. Today we do begin with what I called last week the prolegomena or the foreword to the confession of faith which is this section on the scriptures. Now during the week, and I'm sorry if I'm going to have to walk in front of that a little bit, I came across in a new systematic theology that Robert Raymond has produced an interesting little statement about why the framers of the Confession of Faith began the Confession with the Scriptures. Gus, some notes on the front seat there. Why, 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 why did they begin with the study of the Scriptures? This is what he says. The framers of the Confession, by treating the topic of Holy Scripture in chapter 1, show their theological astuteness they were acutely aware that the primary issue in religion is an epistemological one. Whew, big term. Epistemology really relates to knowledge. And authority and certainty, those sorts of things. So what Robert Raymond is saying is, the framers of the confession 
recognized and understood that really in life one of the biggest issues that faces us is how can we know anything and how can we know anything for sure? Correspondingly, as we begin the study of God and of our whole understanding of the universe as God uh, reveals it to us, there's a, there's a prior question really, and that question is, how can we what? How can we? How can we know? How can we know anything for sure? So in beginning, the Westminster Confession of Faith with a chapter on the scriptures, that's the issue that the, the, the framers of the confession were addressing. No matter what they later confessed, they knew that they could always be challenged with the questions, how do you know that what you confess is so? You might write a confession of faith, but how in the world do you know that it's true? What's your basis for that? Accordingly, they addressed this epistemological issue at the outset, even prior to their treatment of the doctrine of God. We might say, surely if you're studying the Bible, surely if you're studying theology, the study of God, the logical place to begin with is God. Well, maybe not. Maybe the prior logical question is, can we know God? How can we know God? Can we be certain? that what we know about God is true. So that's why we begin the way that the confession does. Okay? Now, in the notes that I've given you, in the square boxes, I have reprinted the text of the confession, which is, as best as we know, the original text of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, it's got the ETHs, the ETHs, the willeths and doeths and workeths and so on, which is a little bit tricky. So what I've also done is given a slightly modified one that was, this was done by the Westminster Fellowship of the Presbyterian Church. It's taken out those ETHs. It's kept very literally to the text otherwise, but it's smoothed it over a little bit. So I've reprinted that in the, the form you've got at the back for a slightly easier one to follow. And the other thing that I've done is to break this up. Now, why don't we just, as we begin, read the original text in one block for this first one, and then I think you'll see why I've chosen to break it up in this kind of form. Follow this through. So here we are, reading that first box on your notes. Although the night of nature, the light of nature, and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto the church and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same wholly unto writing which maketh the holy scripture to be most necessary those former ways of revealing his will unto his people being now ceased now that's a fair mouthful is it not? A fair mouthful. So what I've done is to try and break this down. And perhaps the first thing you can do is note these main headings I've got on the side. I've, I've given this sectional heading, Revelation and Scripture. It could be the necessity of Scripture. And over here in this outline, see what I've got? Initially, there's a statement about general revelation and then about special revelation. Let's follow this through and see if it makes it a little bit clearer for us before we go in and expound it. See, the confession begins, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence manifest to such an extent the goodness, wisdom, and power of God that men are left ex inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient. It begins by acknowledging that there is a revelation that all men have and can see in the light of, or through the light of nature, through the works of creation and providence. Anybody tell us at this point what providence means? The word, what, what's providence? When we talk about providence, there's a whole chapter in the confession on that, but 
theologically, I won't say biblically because it's not a biblical word, it's a theological term. Providence refers to what? God's looking after his upholding and his governing all his creatures and all their actions. So what the writers of the Confession say is, look, the light of nature, the works of creation and providence, manifest to such an extent the goodness, wisdom, and power of God that men are left inexcusable. Nevertheless, it says, these are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and His will which is necessary for salvation. Okay? If you come back to the notes, before we... we'll, we'll just pause at this point. I'm sorry, you, you might just... Forget about the one at the back. You just know you've got a permanent record of that outline there. It's probably easier for you just to keep the text of the notes before you and just follow through this on here as best you're able. Now, you see that initially I've got under this chapter in the notes, I've got this section teaches A, the reality but inadequacy of general revelation. The point that's being made here is that God has given a revelation of his power, goodness, and wisdom in what he has made and in his works of providence, the way he preserves and controls and governs and upholds all things, and it's also in the very nature of man, the light of nature in man. That's the initial assertion. Okay, so in the notes I've got here under point one, the confession acknowledges the reality of a general revelation of God's goodness, wisdom, and power, and through the light of nature, works of providence, etc. Now, I'm going to leave you to read a lot of the notes. The notes are pretty full. We're not going to wade our way all through them. You've got good backup material there. What I'm simply going to do to begin with is to say, the confession has made this statement about the light of nature, the works of creation and providence manifesting the goodness, wisdom, and power of God to leave men inexcusable. Do you know of a scripture that teaches that? Because we've got to anchor this in scripture. Is there anywhere in the scriptures that speaks about God revealing himself in the things that he has made? Anybody? Romans 1. Romans 1 is the great and classical passage. Let's take a look at this for a moment. I'm going to have to keep my eye on that time. There's so much stuff for us to cover here. We'll just have to be careful about this. Romans 1. Catherine, your Bible hasn't got all those green markings in it. I don't know if I'm about to manage. Eh? <laughs> here we are. Romans 1.18 talks about the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against the godlessness and wickedness of men. And the critical thing, I may have mentioned this last week, maybe not. But notice this. Paul, as he writes to the Romans speaks of the way that people suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now that's the contention. Wicked, ungodly people, he says, suppress the truth, and we'll see in a moment what that truth is about, in their wickedness. They hold it underfoot. I was talking to the kids about this the other day and said, imagine you've got a snake coming out of a burrow. If you wanted to stop it coming out, you might, you might not, depending if you had boots on or not, but you probably put your foot on the burrow top if that's enough, but you'd hold it under. And that's the picture here of people suppressing truth that they really already know. Because that's what Paul goes on to say, verse 19. Since he says what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Now here is, in the New Testament, the first and great passage that speaks about the fact that God's been revealing himself. He's made himself known in creation. He has made man in such a way that when man looks at magnificent trees and sees the marvelous way in which sap is drawn up into the tree trunks out to the leaves, chlorophyll is used to create carbon dioxide and water into sugars which feed the plants. You sort of think, man, says, Whew, how in the world did that happen? In the end, an observer is ultimately driven to recognize design and order in the world. Now, people today have got answers for that, I know. 
at least they try to have answers for it, but this is the point that Paul is making. Creation screams. Is there an Old Testament passage also that comes to mind about this? Psalm 19. Psalm. Oh, Psalm. Psalm, 19. Psalm 19. Have you got that, Christina? No, you haven't. How about reading the opening verse or two of Psalm 19? Just a big loud voice so that hands can pick that up on the recording. Okay. Best school teacher's voice. There <laughs> we go. How many verses do you <laughs> Just two or three. I'll tell you when okay. to stop. All right. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Okay, that's enough. Okay, that's fine. Sorry about that. Okay. But that's enough. You see, that psalm is saying that the sun and rising every day and setting every day is a daily testimony to the fact that we're in a supremely orderly, ordered, stable universe. And uh, the, the, the psalmist says, look, this is the voice. This is God has left his fingerprints all over his work. And as people see that, they really have an exhibition of God himself. Now, there's another interesting passage that's connected a little bit more with providence. If you turn to Acts 14 for a moment. And in the 17th verse of Acts 14, Paul was in Lystra, or Lystra, in the region of Galatia, southern Asia in the Roman province, on his first missionary journey. And you remember that when he and Barnabas came to that city, the people thought that they were gods because they performed a miracle. And they wanted to worship him. And Paul prostitutes and says, look, we're just men. And he says, we've come to turn you from the worship of false gods to serve and to true, the, the true and living God. Now look at verse 18. Verse 16, sorry, sorry. Verse 16 of chapter 14 of Acts. He says, in the past, he that is God, let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. Paul is effectively saying again, the returning summers and winters and springs, seed time and harvest, is all an ongoing and constant reflection of God and God's goodness and God's care and God's faithfulness. Now, you might want to explore that a little bit further. And it would be good to pick up and discuss and debate. You can do some of these things together. We don't have to keep moving here or else we'll never get through. <clears throat> the point that the Confession of Faith and the Scriptures make, the point the Scriptures do make is there is a revelation that God has given and that all men do know that. Now, pause for a moment. In the whole area of apologetics, which is... The aspect of Christian theology and thinking and reflection which is concerned with the defense of the faith. There are two broad schools about how we should approach giving a Christian defense for the faith. Now, one of those schools is called an evidentialist school. And it says this, we should endeavor to reason and argue with people from the evidences that there are in the creation backwards to prove that there's a God. So we should begin, for example, and, well, oh, I'd better be careful, Hans is here. You see, Christian science, or, or, or the, not Christian science as a, uh, as a sect, but Christian scientists and the appeal to creation and so on, is a classical evidentialist approach to apologetics. Look at the marvelous design. Look at all these things. Look, and there's no question God's fingerprints is on that. And some people say the best way to impress upon people the reality of God is to take them to the moral order that there is, the fact that tribes everywhere have uh, had a God and oftentimes a sacrificial system. Look at the complexity of nature. Start there and compel people to go backwards to show that there's a God. That's an evidentialist approach. Now, there's another approach which I think sometimes is a little bit militantly antagonistic to the evidentialist, which is a presuppositionalist approach, and it says this. The scriptures 
don't allow you to take the position that God has to be proved. The scriptures say God is evident to everybody. And the real problem is that people don't need proving that there is a God. The real problem is that people suppress that knowledge of God in their wickedness. And therefore, when we endeavor to address men and women about the being and existence of God, the point we've got to aim at is their sinful suppression of that knowledge and challenge them about why does the idea that there's a God create such a problem to you. Now, we're not in a position here to go into dispute on those different strands and streams, but nevertheless, the general track and tack and trend of the Confession of Faith and of the Scriptures, I have to get that order right, don't I? <laughs> but certainly, the expresses of the Confession of Faith say, look, fundamentally, people do know God, they do know God well enough to be inexcusable, and the real problem is the suppression of that knowledge. Anyway, are you happy enough? Do you clear enough what I'm getting at there? Now, the confession says that there is enough light in God's works of creation. We haven't gone into what the light of nature is. You'll find that in the notes. I haven't got time to discuss that. You can explore that fully yourself. The confession says there's enough light in nature to leave men inexcusable, but what else does it say in this opening paragraph? It says there's enough light to leave men inexcusable. In terms of what? In terms of the existence of God, the being of God, the power of God, and the goodness of God. Saying those things are evident and what God has made, and in the way that he has made us with a sense of divinity in us. Is that, that right? But the confession of faith says that light, that natural revelation, is not sufficient for what? For salvation. Yeah, for salvation. Or for knowing how we, as moral image bearers of God, are to live. Let's take those two things. Is there in the structure of leaves, the wonderful profiles of soils, which are really worth studying, I assure you, is there in those things, do you think, traces or something that can enable us to understand or anticipate the fact that God is going to take to himself human nature and become a saviour? I don't, people love to see those analogies and they love to read them back in, but I think that that's what they're doing. They're reading them back in rather than seeing them the other way. I don't think so. I don't think that there is in nature a revelation of covenantal federal headship, which we'll talk about a little bit more, how God is pleased that one should represent the many, both in life and in death. Those things are not there. And the scriptures and certainly the confession of faith says, although, yet, it's not sufficient to give that light of knowledge which is necessary for salvation. And included in that salvation, I think, is not only the message of the cross, but also in terms of how to live. It's interesting, isn't it, when you go back to Genesis chapter 1, after God had made Adam and Eve, and they came from his hand perfect and upright, do you think as they began to gaze at that newly created world that they were able to see the order and the remarkable traces of God's handiwork in it? Do you think so? I, I think so. I think they were able to see. However, by looking at that creation, did they learn of the significance of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or did God have to speak to them about that? He had to speak to them about that. Did they know, simply by looking at a created world, that they were able to eat all the fruit-bearing seed and seed-bearing plants? Well, they might have recognized that was potentially edible. The point I'm making is that even after God made Adam and Eve, and after they were able to see him, and even in their unfallen condition, he needed to speak to them to teach them how to live in a way that was pleasing to him. 
So, this is important to grasp. Natural revelation is adequate to leave men inexcusable concerning the fact that God exists and that he's all powerful, he's their maker and their creator. But it's not sufficient to give the knowledge of salvation. Happy with that? Well, the confession there goes on, goes on to say, therefore, because of that, it pleased the Lord at various times and in different ways to reveal himself and to declare his will to his church and afterwards to commit all this to writing for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corrupt nature and the malice of Satan and of the world, which make the Holy Scriptures most necessary, the former ways of God revealing his will to his people having ceased. Because general revelation is inadequate to give the knowledge of salvation, the merciful God chose at various times and in different ways to reveal himself and declare his will to his church. Okay? Special revelation. What have we got? Let's come back to our notes here. Can we do that? We flip over, in fact, to page 2. As I say, there's a number of uh, statements and various things that you might like to read on the rest of pages 1 and 2. Right down the bottom of page 2 it says in point B, this is the second thing that this section teaches. It teaches that God in his sovereign good pleasure has been pleased to reveal himself and his will to his church. Now the first thing is, the confession notes that this is viewed as a gracious response to the need of sinful men. Do you think that's true to say? That it's God's goodness that spoke into this to make known his saving will. Let's have a look, for example, at Titus chapter 2. This is just an illustration of this. In Titus chapter 2, you got a interesting little statement it's not talking directly about this but it's very very closely related Paul's been talking about how Titus has got to teach slaves to live in a way that's consistent with the gospel in verse 11 of Titus he says this Titus chapter 2 he says for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness, etc. Paul can speak to Titus about God's saving acts in Christ. And he describes it as the grace of God that brings salvation. The whole of God's act in salvation is an act of grace. Completely undeserved, unmerited. Now that's true of his sending his son into the world, his saving acts in Jesus. It's also true in terms of the revelation of his word. It's gracious, gracious, totally gracious and undeserved that he should do that. So, therefore it pleased the Lord. When you see theologians using that term pleased, it's an allusion to the sovereign good pleasure of God doesn't mean to say he just got a kick out of it. It just says, it pleased God in his sovereign, gracious goodness. He was pleased at various times and in different ways to reveal himself and to declare his will to the church. What have we got in point two here? Over the page, can you turn on page three? Well... Bottom of two, beginning of three. This is, the confession's making the point that God was pleased at various times in different ways to reveal himself. Does the scripture give us clear evidence and record of God revealing himself? Does he reveal himself? If so, how? What sort of ways has he done that? Has God revealed himself to men? Has he kept himself hidden? Any ideas? What are some of the ways in which he's revealed himself? At Mount Sinai, how did God reveal himself? One way was he revealed himself what? Thunder and well, thunder and lightning were the accompaniments of it, but there at Mount Sinai, God actually what? 
spoke. He spoke. And his voice was like thunder, and people heard the voice of God. And lived. So one of the ways God's revealed himself is by his direct speaking. Direct speaking to people. Another way is that God has revealed himself by granting visions. Is that correct? Visions to people in their dream sleep. Nebuchadnezzar. Other people. Joseph. Visions. Dreams. Uh, what sorts of other ways? He sometimes appeared in what we call theophanies, which are appearings or manifestations of God. Burning bush. Burning bush. That kind of thing. So... The scriptures again and again and again and again refer to the fact of God speaking either directly or through people. In the prophets, you've often got what kind of little expression? In the prophets, repeatedly, we read this, the Lord, what? Or the word of the Lord came to so-and-so. Or the Lord said to so-and-so or spoke. So I think the scriptures are littered with the fact that God has been pleased to reveal himself in terms of Old Testament revelation. don't know if we talked about I know I've talked about this recently, perhaps in another class, but don't think we talked about this last week. What's the supreme way that God's been pleased to reveal himself? Through his son, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. This is the, the most important text in this regard. Let's read it. It just says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Are you happy about that? But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. The supreme way in which God has spoken to people is through his Son, whom at the beginning of, or who at the beginning of John chapter 1, John speaks of or describes him as the, what, as the... In the beginning was the Word. Incidentally, John picks that up also in Revelation chapter 19. The rider of that white horse has a name written on that garment. And one of those names is what? The Word of God. Yes, again. What that means is that the Son, the second person of the Divine Trinity, has a unique function and role to communicate the being, mind, and will of God to man. And he's come amongst us. So John could write at the beginning of 1 John, he said, that which we have, what? Which we have seen with our eyes, looked upon, heard, handled. The word of God became flesh, dwelt amongst us. So God has spoken. And that's what's being recognized here. Sinful man did need to know God, needed to know God radically, needed to know the mystery of salvation. And God graciously, at various times and in different ways, has chosen to reveal himself and declare his will to the church. Okay? Nobody got a big problem in that regard. Right, well, we come to page three on your notes, and we'll see here... Here's the third main idea that's contained in this paragraph, namely that God has committed this revelation of himself and his will to writing. Here we are. And afterwards, it pleased God to commit all this to writing. Now, I'm very hesitant about questioning anything the Confession of Faith says. <laughs> I mean, I think it's got to be questioned, but I sometimes wonder about this little word, all, because I think I've indicated to you, and uh, certainly another class, in John chapter 20 in particular, we know that there were many things that Jesus said and did were not written in the books. And if everything was to be written, the whole world couldn't contain everything that had been said. And uh, we've reason to believe that prophets spoke numbers of things that we don't know. We know, for example, in 2 Kings, that the prophet Jonah actually came to Jeroboam the second and prophesied and told him that he would recapture the kingdoms of the northern kingdom. Now, we know that from the story, but we don't actually have a written record of Jonah's words to Jeroboam, do we? They're not there, not in the scriptures. So 
I think that we must appreciate this, that there is a distinction between all that God has been pleased to reveal for his people, for their guidance and instruction, and what he has preserved in the scriptures. He has preserved all that his people need to know at any point for their salvation and their guidance. But I don't think we can say that every utterance and word that has ever been revealed by God through a prophet is contained in written form. And certainly not all the words that Jesus spoke are for us. Anyway, that's just a minor qualification of it. The critical and wonderful thing is that God not only spoke these things, but afterwards it pleased him to commit this to writing for the better preserving. So here's the reasons for it. For the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church. Do you think there are a couple of good reasons for having it written? For the more sure preserving and propagating. What would we have been left with if the scriptures were not written? We would have been left with oral tradition, would that not be correct? And ultimately no certain reference. Isn't it a wonderful thing to have the certainty of Scripture? And what an awful thing it would be to not be sure of the Scriptures. So for the more sure preserving, they were written. And not only that, propagating. Is it easier, particularly in our day, to propagate written material stuff? Stuff you got down in books? Sure it is. Then simply if you relied on this transmission. We could go through that silly little exercise that people do and get somebody to start a story of three sentences long at this end and then hear it at the end here and we would find that once again the punctuation, the intonation at least if not actual words and facts are distorted along the way. So it is for the more sure preserving and propagating the truth and the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corrupt nature, the malice of Satan in the world, that God's written these things. It's a tremendous blessing to have the written scriptures, to be sure, and to have a sure record of God's word. Okay? Happy. Any questions? And here we've got, which make the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, the formal ways of God's revealing his will to his people having ceased. Now, here the confession makes a really strong statement regarding the sufficiency of scripture. There's more about this next week. That's a section of the confession's first chapter on the sufficiency of scripture. So we won't go into this too long now, too much now, except just to appeal back again to that Hebrews 1 passage. In former times God spoke, but in these last times he's spoken through his son. There is a strong, robust contrast between the earlier ways of God speaking and the final way in which God spoke. Could there be a fuller and more marvelously adapted revelation of God and his will, do you think, than the incarnation of God himself? I, I don't think so. I think. God can speak from a distance. He can send messages through prophets. But when he actually shows himself, and what's more, shows himself not in burning light that makes everybody tremble and knocks the breath out of them, but in a way where people can see and handle and hear and touch, that is a marvelously accommodated way. And so we ask the question, can there be a more wonderful, complete, and full way of God revealing himself than through his Son? And to go backwards to older ways of dreams and visions and partial revelations and so on is going backwards rather than forwards. But there's other explanations for this as well, which we'll deal with next week. Okay, now don't, please feel free to interact in a little bit. But let's just see, at this stage, this first, first article of the fish, Confession of Faith, summarizing the teaching of Scripture, says the Scriptures are necessary. The Scriptures are necessary because although there's a light of nature that enables us to see that God is, <clears throat> we cannot through that know the way of salvation and know how God wants us to live. 
And so it's been necessary that God should speak and reveal his grace to us. And he's done so, and he's done so and preserved that, all that we need of that, for our comfort and stability. Happy? Do you agree with that? Is there any problems with that? Any questions about that? <coughs> right. Well, we go home early. We'll see. Not that I maliciously want to do that. Let's then move on to page four of your notes. And here is a little section dealing with the contents and nature and purpose of the scripture. That's the heading I've given that. The contents, nature, and purpose of the scriptures. What does the text say here? Let's read this first part anyway, which is Article 2. It says, Under the name of Holy Scripture, or the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, which are these. And the original text of the Confession of Faith names all the books, the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New. Names those. And it says this, All these books are inspired by God to be the standard for doctrine and practice. Okay? So the, the confession has begun by making this point. God has spoken. God has not only spoken, but God's also been pleased to commit that spoken or that re revelation of himself into writing. Now, this section is basically saying, how do we know what those writings are? What are they? And how can we know? And what's different or what's special about them? So, this is what we've got. Perhaps look at the headings I've got in the notes here. These sections teach, A, that the complete canon of Holy Scripture is contained in the books of the Old and New Testament. One, there is now a collection of books called the Holy Scripture or the Word of God written. Point two, I've got this collection is complete and contains the books of the Old and New Testament. Right, let's pick up one or two things in this. Firstly, the term canon. I've mentioned that, I think, in the past, maybe have. Canon means standard or rule. And in connection with the scriptures, the canon of scripture is the authoritative body of books that are recognized as holy scriptures. Holy Scriptures, and the canon of the church, or the canon of the script, the church has recognized these 66 books so in, 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 the, in the scriptures. So under the name, that's the name given, Holy Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3, sorry, you remember what Paul, talking and writing to Timothy, says, <coughs> He's warning Timothy not to be misled by false teachers. He says, remember how from a youth you were taught the, what? Taught the Holy Scriptures. And then he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Paul is there using the term Scripture, which is the term graphe in Greek, just means writings, really. But in the apostolic language, the term Scripture came to have this technical association with Holy Scripture or special writings. You find a similar thing also in 2 Peter, where um, Peter warns against those who will rest the Scriptures. 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, and he basically says this. He's talking about the Apostle Paul. He says his letters contain, in verse 16, he says his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. You see, those verses tell us that the New Testament apostles recognized that there were a body of writings that they called scriptures. That's, that's where it's been translated, scriptures. Now, here... The Christian Church in this Assembly of Divines has basically said this, under the name of Scripture, or the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament. 
So it basically lists this and defines those books and only those books. We'll come back and discuss this a bit more fully in the moment, so let's just follow these through. Then it says about these books that they are inspired by God and consequently the standard for doctrine. Back to our notes, what have I got written here that might be here? Uh... Under point B, you'll note this, I've got this section's teaching that these books are distinguished from all others by being inspired by God to be a rule of faith and life. One, the defining character of the scriptural books relates to their inspiration by God. Now the term inspiration derives from William Tyndale's translation of 2 Timothy 3.16. Tyndale put it, all scripture is inspired by God. Now, I hope the preschool doesn't mind me saying that. The word in the Greek there is a word theopneustos, something like that. Hasn't got that S there. Theo, which is God, and this means from pneuma or breath. And it simply means God breathed. And it's worthwhile noting that because oftentimes that term inspired today can be used rather sentimentally or generally, can't it? Say, man, that was an inspired talk. When we use that and we kind of mean what? We mean well, somebody got that from somewhere, don't we <laughs> almost think that? Or perhaps we think it was inspiring, we're thinking about it in terms of its effect upon us. And so the term can be used rather generally today, and as I say, somewhat almost sentimentally. What Paul, the word Paul uses in 2 Timothy 3 is God-breathed. These scriptures are breathed out by God, they are God's words, God has spoken them, God has breathed them, and that's the distinguishing character about the scriptures. Unhesitatingly, we should say that these scriptures are God's words. They are. They are His breath, His words, every single one of them. His word. God has spoken them, God has breathed them. And that is the distinguishing and critical factor, God is the author, the divine author and source of these words. Does that mean to say that the human writers are of no impact or influence in the writing of Scripture? Does that, does that mean that, well, what is the relationship between God speaking and man speaking? Do you think God dictated all the words of the Scriptures? Do you think so, Gerald? You don't. You don't think so. I can always get a bite out of Gerald. Yeah, there are personalities in their own mind writing yeah. things. Well, where does this? How, how do you? How do you bring together this whole idea then that that the Bible is God's word? It's God breathed, and and the fact that there were human writers involved. How did it happen? Is there something in the Scriptures that tell us how the divine and human come together? 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 21. Have a look. Somebody's got that. Read it up for us. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. These are, are very, very important verses. Anybody? Who's got it? 2, 2 Peter, 2 Peter, chapter 1. Chapter 1. No hey, that's 2 Timothy you've got oh, there, my sorry, dear. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Anybody? Come on. Peter, okay. one, verse. Well, I think it's about verse 20, 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Pause there for the moment. Above all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of the Scriptures came about through the prophet's own interpretation, the prophet's own insight, the prophet's own inspiration, the prophet's own conception. All of those things are involved. He says, you must understand, no word of prophecy ever came into being by that means. But, what? Waiter? Well, the prophecy never had its origin in the word of man, 
when men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That word carried along is used seldom in the New Testament. One place it's used, in fact, is of the ship, the boat, in Acts chapter 27. When do you remember that terrible storm? And the boat that Paul was on was carried in front of that storm for those days. It was borne along by the wind and the waves. So there was a divine compulsion. Now, that's what Peter is saying there. He's saying, listen, men wrote the scriptures, the prophets were involved in communicating God's word to men, but understand this, that when they spoke prophetically the word of God, their message didn't come from them, but it came from God. They were born along. There was a whole ministry of the Holy Spirit in them, using their personalities, their language forms and so on, but nevertheless supervising and controlling so that everything they wrote was in fact what God wanted them to write. So that it can be viewed as His Word, God's Word. Okay? So here we are, building this doctrine of Scripture, building this, this whole notion of how can we know there's a God, how can we know there's anything true? Well, the frame of the confession say first thing is God left his fingerprints everywhere. People can see it if they will. But second, in addition to that, God actually spoke and revealed himself and his will to men and he inscripturated that. Where do you find that? You find that in the 66 books of the Old and the New Testament, which we call the canonical books of Scripture. These all have the feature of being inspired by God and they are given to us for essentially a practical purpose rather than speculative. Two minutes before we break, let's just come away from our notes for a moment. The issue of canon and of deciding which books are in and which books are out. Anybody? How is that determined? How do we know that we've got all the books that there should be? Uh, how do we know? How did the church know? Did somebody stand in a position and make a decision about which books were in or out or what? The books themselves, you can tell the books are inspired, but also the books that Jesus um, are quoted. Okay, anybody else? Who, Guy has said you can tell from the books themselves they are self attesting self-validating we'll come back to that in a second Jesus also authenticated or endorsed the books of the Old Testament anybody else want to add to that or question that or is that the case or not there certainly was a process that the church went through of clarifying and cementing which books belong to the Bible but did that involve the church sitting in judgment upon those books, subjecting the books to various tests of grammar, literature, and theology, and saying in the end, yes, this one gets a 95% pass or a 99% assurance or certainty? Do you think that that's... Is that what the church did? There was a bit of that, wasn't there? There was good point. There was certainly a lot of debate. There was certainly a lot of debate. There's no question. Books like 2 Peter, James, they were really hassled, yeah. So there was a bit of that went on in the process. But at heart, fundamentally, the process of recognizing the canon or the books that belong to the scriptures did people basically appoint a court to make judgments and sit above them and say these are in, these out, or not? No, they didn't. And there's a good reason why the church could never do that, because if the church actually did that, the church would actually be exalting what? Their knowledge, their men, their criteria above Scripture and basically saying, well, church, the, the people of the church can say, that's scripture so we can listen to what it says about God. Now, that's too risky. <laughs> but what the church did was it recognized that God, that, number one, it said, 
And what it was talking about and what the church was trying to understand is it was trying to recognize the books that God had spoken. They were trying to recognize God's word. Okay, that's what they were really trying to do. And they said, God's word speaks for itself. That's what they basically said. It speaks for itself. We'll see a little bit later what's behind that. And so the church's task was really of recognizing those books that had that self-attesting character about them, that they were God's words and not man's words. They didn't set up a tribunal and standards. There were certain... What about Catholic Church? Don't they, they set their own standards? In what regard, Bim? The Catholic Church. Don't they endorse some other Jewish writings as well? Yeah, we'll come to that a little bit later. Okay, come to that. Phew, I can put that off. <laughs> no, we will come to that a little bit later. And it's important to see that because this is all written against that backdrop. Okay, so, so that is basically how the church has come to recognize the canon. I mean, there's various criteria that have been established for canonical status in the New Testament. Things like it's got to be apostolic, or had apostolic endorsement and various other things about it. But in the end, that's not how the church recognized 29 books in the New Testament. They recognized 29 books in the New Testament because there were certain books that came to them with the authority of God. And God spoke to them through those books. They were conscious of the Holy Spirit endorsing those books and they received it as God's word, not just man's word. So that's really underlying the whole issue of selection. They didn't make up criteria to judge it. They rather just recognized the books that spoke themselves as God's word to them. So the other books were false? Or yes. False? There's, there's a word that's used, a big technical word again, which is a pseudopigrapha. And that's just pseudographa, pigrapha writings, false writings. And a little bit more about that when we come look at the Apocrypha after the break. Can we leave it like that for a moment? God has spoken. His words have been preserved in writings. Those writings are in a group of books we call the Holy Scriptures that have got the characteristic of being the Word of God. They are inspired words from God. They are God's Word because they have been given by inspiration, the outbreathing of God. Okay, that's the way the confession follows through here. Let's take a break. Go outside, get some deep, fresh breathing going on. And we'll come in. Can I say that one of the most interesting sections ahead of us tonight is the whole issue of authority and on what basis are we to actually receive the Bible as the Word of God. But more about that afterwards. Let's go and have a break. Right, Ernie, how are you? Back, back with us? Are you right there, Ernie? <laughs> yes, hello Heather. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's excellent. Lovely. We'll get started here and uh, he'll be back in a minute. Okay. Picking up again just how the... Um, How the confession of faith develops its doctrine of Scripture. Remember, the, the reason we've begun with this is to find out how can we know about God. We can know about God because God has spoken. <coughs> His words have been written in the inspired Scriptures contained in the canonical books of the Scriptures, the 66 books of the Scriptures. Now, the confession goes on. Because it was dealing, as Bim suggested earlier on, with the claim of the Roman Catholic Church that in addition to these 66 books, there were other books as well, the Confession makes a particular point of saying the books commonly called the Apocrypha, not being inspired by God, are not a part of the canon of Scripture. And therefore, they have no authority in the Church of God, nor are they to be approved <coughs> 
or made use of in a manner different from other human writings. Firstly, how many of you have heard of the Apocrypha? Have you heard of it? Heard of it? How many books in the Apocrypha, roughly? About 14, I think, something in that order. I have to confess that I'm not a student of them, haven't bothered <laughs> reading or studying them in depth. Um, the word Apocrypha, incidentally, anybody know what that means? It means the things that are hidden. The things that are hidden. Hidden things. Now, in your notes, I've got a little bit of a comment here just about where they've come from. So on page 5, under point C, point 1. The term Apocrypha refers to a group of books written in the intertestamental period. The period between Malachi and Matthew. About 450 years of prophetic silence, and that's where these books belong to. The word Apocrypha, anything hidden, has been applied to certain ancient writings whose authorship is not manifest or <coughs> obvious or clear. Nobody knows for sure who wrote these books and for which unfounded claims have been set up for a place in the canon. Some of these have been associated with the Old Testament and some with the New. Now we'll just read on here in our notes what we've got. They have never been recognized as part of the canon of Scripture by Jews or Protestant Scripture. The books commonly called Apocrypha were never admitted into the list of canonical books until the Council of Trent at its fourth session in 1546. <coughs> now, those of you that have studied church history will know that the Council of Trent was a council of who? Of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. It was a counter-reformation council. <coughs> Remember Luther, about 1517? And uh, this is about 20 years, 30 years after Luther. The Roman Catholic Church rallied, and in a council of Trent, which had a number of sessions over quite an extended period of years, it came up with a number of decrees and statements. <coughs> And one of those statements of the Council of Trent was that the books of the Apocrypha should be included in the canon. Right up until the 16th century, they were never ever included in the canon. The first time they came to be associated with the Bible in any form at all was in the translation of the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint abbreviated LXX, which in Roman numbers or equivalent of LXX is what? 70, taken from the number of scholars, about 72 scholars based or centered in Alexandria and Egypt who translated the Old Testament scriptures into Greek. Now they included the apocryphal books with their translation. Now after this, the next main, the next main uh, person to associate the apocryphal books with the scripture was Jerome, and Jerome translated the scriptures into what language? Latin. Latin. Into Latin, and that's called the what the. Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. Now, not surprisingly, because the Roman Catholic Church from the 5th or so century through to the 16th century relied very, very much on Jerome's Latin Vulgate as the authoritative scriptures and used them as... It's not surprising that they effectively came to include the apocryphal books with the scriptures. But it wasn't, however, until that Council of Trent in 1546 that they were ever formally recognized by any church council or body as part of the scriptures. Prior to that, the canonical books were always just limited to the 66, at least from about the third century on. Quite clearly, the 66 books of our Old and New Testament only at the Council of Trent. 
that they came to be recognized in any way. Fair enough? Let's read on this quote here. We've got this. It was at the Council of Trent that they were placed in the same rank with the inspired writings. They are rejected by the Protestant churches for the following reasons. The Jews to whom the oracles of God were committed and who were never blamed for unfaithfulness to their trust never acknowledged these books to be of divine authority. Palestinian Jews never ever did that. <coughs> They were written, not written in Hebrew, but in Greek language, and the authors of them were posterior to Malachi, that's after Malachi, in whom, according to the universal testimony of the Jews, the spirit of prophecy ceased. And it is actually interesting, I've not read them myself, but I was reading during the week comments, uh, and it's interesting that two of the apocryphal writers make an acknowledgement of the fact that the spirit of prophecy ceased with Malachi. So here you've got these apocryphal writers acknowledging that the spirit of prophecy ceased. Now, the spirit of prophecy is in essence the spirit of inspired scripture. So with their own words, in a way, they say they're not in the same class as the inspired scriptures. So the key thing, the first thing is that the Jews didn't accept them. Now we've got also that no part of these books is quoted by Christ or the Apostles, nor a single word found in all the New Testament from which it can be inferred that such books were in existence. There is a question as to whether in Jude there is an allusion to Enoch in Jude and Michael that's sometimes thought to be associated with this, with the Apocrypha, but there are again disputes over to whether that's the case. I don't know enough about it to speak anything, just simply know <coughs> that that is a point now the other point is that these books contain many things erroneous superstitious and immoral and some of the writers instead of advancing a claim to inspiration acknowledge their own weakness and apologize for their defects man I'm having trouble tonight with these microphones listen to what uh, Edward J. Young no relative says he says, there are no marks in these books that would attest to divine origin. Both Judith and Tobit, for example, two of these books, contain historical, chronological, and geographical eras. These are not just being, these statements are not just being made loosely. They are easily identifiable geographical, historical, and chronological eras. The books justify falsehood and deception and make, the, and make salvation to depend upon works of merit. <laughs> Ecclesiasticus and the Wisdom of Solomon, two other books, inculcate a morali morality based upon expediency. In other words, if it works, do it. Wisdom and other books teaches the creation of the world out of pre-existent matter. Chapter 11, verse 17. Ecclesiasticus teaches that the giving of alms makes atonement for sin. Chapter 3, verse 30. And in Barak, another book, it is said that God hears the prayers of the dead. And in 1 Maccabees, there are again these historical and geographical sort of eras. So, these are some of the features of these books that have led the church to say they are of a different class to the canonical books. But the other thing is, when you read them, they have the character about them of men's writings. They don't have that spirit attestation that convinces us, as we'll see in a moment, that these are God's words. So these are the reasons the Protestant Church has not adopted the Apocrypha. Partly because there are errors, partly because the principle of the analogy of faith, that is the inner consistency of scripture breaks down because there are things said in the Apocrypha not true and contradicted in the rest of the Bible, but also because they miss that element of divine attestation. That's what's led the church anyway to reject them. So they're not to have any authority, nor to be approved or made use of in a manner different from the other human writings. All right, so I hope that's helped you understand, number one, a little bit about what the Apocrypha is.
Secondly, how it came to be included in the Roman Catholic canon of the scriptures. And thirdly, why Protestants have not accepted it as being of canonical status. Those are the sorts of things involved. Now, there are other books on the canon of scripture that are written that go into that in much greater depth, but that's fair enough. God has spoken, moved men to write his word. That word is contained in the 66 books of the scriptures. There are other writings like the Apocrypha not received as canonical books. Right, that leads us to this last section we're going to look at tonight, which is the authority of the scriptures. Which is really, how can we be sure that these books are the Word of God. Now, last week I gave to those of you that were doing or are doing this course for credit a list of term assignments. Let me just read again the first of those suggested topics because this is the section that deals with it. So if you're thinking about doing this, this is the one to prick your ears up. The question was, or the assignment topic was, as Christians we claim that the Bible is God's word and thus the authoritative guide for what we are to believe concerning him and how we are to live to please him. That's what we claim, right? It's the authoritative word of God. Now, how would you answer someone who asks you in the course of a conversation, how can you be sure that the Bible is God's word? Somebody asks you that question, how can you be sure that the Bible is God's word? This is how the framers of the Confession of Faith really address that issue. And they say this, the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed. In other words, they're saying authority is that quality of the scriptures that give it the force of a document that is to be believed and obeyed. If somebody is an authoritative, it's an authoritative figure is somebody who's got right. What right do we have to receive the scriptures as something to be believed and obeyed? It's the weight, the force. It is that for which we ought to believe and obey. Why ought we believe and obey the scriptures? It says here, it does not depend firstly upon the testimony of any man or the church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author of it. And therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. Here is the classic Reformed Christian statement of what is the basis for accepting and receiving the Bible as authoritative, something to be believed, received, and obeyed? Is it because important men have said the Bible is authoritative, the Word of God? Is it because the church has done so? No. The reason why we receive, believe, and obey this is because it's God's Word. He's the author of it, and there's no other reason. The authority of the Scriptures ultimately stands or falls on whether it's an inspired Word from God. If it's not the inspired Word of God, then ultimately we've got no ground for being sure and confident that this is truth and we should listen to it and obey it. That's the thing, because God's its author, that's what gives it authority. Let's just follow through the notes at this point that I've got. And we'll tease open this a little bit. Okay, these two sections that we're going to look at just under this teach that A, the authority of the scriptures does not rest upon the testimony of any man or the church, but upon God its author. Now, in this next section, we're going to go on and look at a few things, but we'll just leave that for a second. Although it is right and proper to be moved to a high esteem of the Scriptures by the testimony of men, their authority over us 
of the scriptures does not depend upon human testimony or degree, decree. Most of us have been brought up, many of us will have been brought up with an innate reverence for this. Okay? I was. This black book, which in my parents' household had a red binding to it, was a different book. It just gathered dust, never read, but you knew this was a holy book. And most of us grow up respecting it, and we respect it because our parents have told us. And it's right to be moved. Does the Bible, and I'm asking this as a genuine question, not a rhetorical one, does the Bible support the idea that parents should teach children to respect the Word of God? Yeah, it does. The Bible doesn't rule out the fact that it's proper for people to be moved to regard this book by human testimony. There is a place for parents to testify to it and for the church to testify to it. But it's saying ultimate authority doesn't rest upon the testimony of any man. Now, the, the reason the framers of the Confession of Faith say that is again a little bit of the historical background because What's the historical background? I know it's written in your notes, don't need to look at that for a second, but what's the historical background that they are writing out of? The scriptures, okay? Any, 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 anybody know? Moses is uh, becoming a nation. No, 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 no. That's not what the confession, the writers of the confession, uh, they are writing in a context of dispute with the, especially the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church taught basically what? It said that the church I hope it's not contradictory what I said before but the, the Roman Catholic Church actually did teach that it was the church that established the scriptures and it was the church and upon the church's authority that they were to be received. Let's see what we've got here. A couple of quotations here. <coughs> Under point one, A point one, I've got this. The first dash says this. The Westminster Confession of Faith does not want to deny that it is proper to obtain a respect for the scriptures from human sources, only that their final authority doesn't depend upon such. It doesn't want to deny that in our Christian experience we're first taught by our parents or the church to bow to the authority of scripture. It is concerned about the entire matter of final authority in spiritual affairs and wants to assert that it is intrinsic to Scripture as the Word of God and that it is not something extrinsic to it, something given to it by man or the church. It's saying Scripture's authority rests in the fact it's the Word of God, not because somebody has said you should obey this. In this, it denies the historical claim of the Roman Catholic Church. The Baltimore Catechism, question 1327, states, for example, that it is only from tradition preserved in the Roman Catholic, in the Catholic Church that we can know which of the writings of ancient times are inspired and which are not inspired. So that catechism is effectively saying that it's the Church, and only the testimony of the Church, can tell us which books are inspired, which books are not. Now, this proposition, we read on, is designed to deny, so this proposition here, is designed to deny the Romish heresy that the inspired church is the ultimate source of all divine knowledge, and that the written scripture and ecclesiastical tradition alike depend upon the authoritative seal of the church for their credibility. Roman Catholic Church contended that the sources of authority for Christians were the scriptures that the church endorsed and secondly, a body of tradition which the church also endorsed. So the Roman Catholic Church claimed the right power and authority to determine what was authoritative and what was not. So this statement is rejecting that. They thus make the scriptures, the Roman Catholic Church, a product of the spirit through the church, while in fact the church is a product of the spirit through the instrumentality of the scriptures. They kind of turn it on its head. 
Their theologians taught that since the church had established the canon, scripture owed its authority to the witness of the church. The further belief that Christ had given the Holy Spirit to the magisterium or teaching office of the church to enable it to interpret the word of God infallibly contributed to the dominance of the church's authority over scripture. That is the classical Roman Catholic position. The church tells you what's scripture and what's not scripture and the reason you're to accept this as the word of God is because the church tells you. Protestants have denied that. They've said the reason those books are in the Bible because they're God's word. And ultimately the authority of the scriptures arises from that, not the testimony of any man or woman. Now, I've got a little note here. It's not correct to assert, as many do, that this is still the position of all Roman Catholics today. It would be wrong to the facts to create the impression that all Roman Catholics today believe still that Scripture holds has its authority derived from the Church. There's plenty of evidence, Wilkinson says, that many Catholic scholars do believe in the primacy of the Bible and operate on that assumption as do many of the laity in the Church. Whatever the official position of the Roman Catholic Church, it is a matter for gratitude to God that in practice there is often a recognition of the authority of the Bible and an eagerness to learn from it that is distinctly present in modern Catholicism. So we can't say it's necessarily true still of all. Yes, John? What about the apocryphal books? Do they still hold to those? It's the official church dogma that it is. In terms of whether these more evangelical Roman Catholics do or not, I couldn't tell you offhand. Did anybody else know? I'm not sure about that, John. little research project for you. Get on the internet and you can do that. Any other comments or questions? Why are they still there then? Why are they still there? What? In the Catholic Church, they hold to the inerrancy of the scripture is the same. They obviously don't understand it the same way as we understand it. Uh, it's not a question of the inerrancy of the scriptures. It's an issue of the completeness of the scriptures, the sufficiency of it. Not the inerrancy, but the completeness. The other point is that once a council, an official council of the church has made a declaration on something, it's very, very difficult given the, uh, again, the conciliar statement of the infallibility of the Pope and of church councils to go back on that. So if you've got a council in 1546 that includes the Apocrypha as the scriptures, that kind of have sealed themselves into that or else they have to go back and say that councils can err. The Confession of Faith makes the point that councils of men can and do err. Is that correct? Can and do err. Roman Catholicism with its commitment to the special function of the magisterium which is the teaching office of the church plus papal infallibility locks itself into a position of effectively saying that its official declarations in church councils and certainly pronouncements by the Pope ex cathedra have the force of being the word of God or are infallible. So they can't knock it out. Uh, every, every, every Sunday the readings are predetermined throughout the whole year. Yep. And you will find that the readings are included from the would have to be in the lectionary of the Catholic Church, yeah. All right, well, last section, and I appreciate it. it's difficult to stick with this on hot nights and probably any night, but no, I'm sorry about this. Um, no, I'm right. So in that first section, really, the confession has been talking about the basis of scriptural authority it's nature defined, negatively, positively stated here. Now it's got our assurance of its authority. Let's have a look. I think this is a beautiful section, an interesting section. It says this. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture. Is that contradicting what we've been saying or not? We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a, to a high and reverent esteem. 
I think that's true. The church should be impressing upon people the wonderful character of the scriptures and urging their authority. So the church does have a role in seeking to induce a high and reverent esteem for the scriptures. And says, and the divine origin and content, and it goes through a number of things, are arguments by which it abundantly gives evidence it's the word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a wonderful section, which is effectively saying, look, there are good grounds, both from the external testimony of the church and others, and from the internal characteristics of the scriptures, that we should receive it as the word of God. There are good grounds there, good reasons for it. But our full persuasion and assurance is not from the testimony of the church, nor even from the wonderful features of the Bible itself, but from the work of the Holy Spirit, who witnesses by and with the Word in our hearts. Now this is a terrific section, and this is where the whole issue of how can we know that the Bible is the Word of God? Well, number one says, you can listen to what the Church has said through the ages, and that's not a bad thing to do. In fact, it's a fall who thinks that all knowledge begins now and intends to carve out a whole understanding of theology and the Christian faith for himself. That's foolish, absolute foolish in a denial of the Spirit of God and the Church of Christ and the oneness of the Church of Christ. You don't do that. You don't do that. So you can learn from that. And the divine origin and content, here's a list of features about the scriptures themselves. Divine origin and content, the efficacy of the doctrine. What does that mean, that term mean? The efficacy of the doctrine. Efficacy. Sorry, these big words, old words here. The efficacy of the doctrine. Effectiveness in the way that it works. That's right. The effectiveness in the way that it works. The way in which the doctrine of the gospel, for example, does provide such a complete, complete salvation and deliverance from sin. The way in which it, it, it settles the fears of people and gives hopes to people. The doctrines of the Bible are efficacious. They, dear I say it, they work and accomplish God's purpose powerfully. So the divine origin and the effectiveness of the doctrine, the way it does, it is the power of God unto salvation. It changes men, transforms men. The majesty of the style, the harmony of all the parts. Okay, 40 odd writers writing over a thousand year period and yet incredible harmony and unity. The scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God. The thrust of the whole of the Bible is consistently to honor God. The full revelation it gives of the only way of man's salvation and many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection of it. These things are arguments by which it abundantly gives evidence that it's the word of God. So, what it's basically saying is, look, you can look at the Bible, you can look at this, this wonderful book, and you can see, and you just, you just think about this. You just posit this as a logical, rational argument. Do you suppose that if in the space of a thousand years, from a thousand AD to two thousand AD, you asked forty different people, you asked forty different people in a number of different countries to write on the same theme, would you expect to find an incredible, a flawless consistency? I, I would be surprised anyway, <laughs> across that period of time, that spectrum of people. But the Bible has an incredible inner harmony as we're going to be tracing in our biblical theology course. And, and that in itself, you've got to say, well, whoo, whoo, whoo. The way in which people can write and they can be so radically honest about heroes. I'm reading a book before I go to bed to try and relax my mind at the moment. And it's a story in which the hero, while there might be one or two tiny, tiny little dents in it, 
is still a hero, and, and, and he comes out winner every time. In the end, he's winner every time. That's the way we kind of look along. But the Bible has David committing the vilest murder and uh, adultery. And, and other things, the Bible's radical honesty, and there's things like that you've got to say, well, boy, aren't these evidences we're dealing with a book that couldn't just be written by men? Now, you can multiply these arguments, and to people whose hearts are convinced especially, you can say they're good arguments, <laughs> there's good grounds there in these various things. Is that right? They abundantly give evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. And yet we come up with this, yet notwithstanding. Our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority of Scripture, you've got these two words here, infallible truth. That is, that term infallible means it is not misleading. It's not just that it's accurate, but it means that it is true truth, not misleading, not going to fall to the ground. Our assurance, ultimately, that the scriptures are infallible truth and divine authority is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit. Now, just need to pause for a moment before we explain the next one. We've mentioned how the reformers, the central stream of the Reformation, on the one hand, was contending with Roman Catholic errors. Was there also another stream in another direction that the reformers were battling against? It was the errors of the Anabaptists or the radical reformers. And one of the errors of the radical reformers and Anabaptists was they tended to place a great deal of weight and emphasis upon inner light. <clears throat> In fact, you see, it was part of the, the whole impetus that drove the radical reformers further than the mainstream reformers was their commitment to the Holy Spirit working within and uh, the inner renewal of people. Well. That went to a point where many of them began to rely in a major way upon inner light and inner revelation apart from the Holy Scriptures. Okay, apart from the Scriptures. Now, here, the Confession of Faith is making it quite clear that it's missing out on that era too. It's, it, it's refuting the Roman Catholic position to say, look, the ground of our authority is because the church says so. It dis dis denies that. But it denies this other idea as well, that we can be sure the scriptures are the word of God by the witness of the spirit independent of the scriptures themselves. In other words, people are saying, well, last night when I was sitting by the fireside watching the flames dance in a cold snowy night, the Holy Spirit whispered into my mind and heart, that book is the word of God. Now, the reformers are denying that. They're saying this inward work of the Holy Spirit is a work in which he witnesses by and with the Word in our hearts. Now, this, is, I think, is a tremendously important thing and a thrilling thing. Framers of the Confession of Faith are saying there is no extra revelation connected with this certainty that the Scriptures are the Word of God. There's no extra word given to confirm that. But rather, the Spirit witnesses in our hearts as He works, or witnesses by and with the Word in our hearts. Now, let me give an illustration of this. I'm being very honest here. Last week, I was conscious that in spite of all the reading and thinking, in spite of the regular discipline, devotional life that I, was, I, I, I do live, I was conscious of being spiritually dry. In a way, in a real way. In the sense, 
that although my mind was working a lot with things, just in terms of the uh, inward refreshment and vigor of faith and life and joy and peace and so on, I was a bit of a shell, really. I wasn't hypocritical. I wasn't trying to bluff these students and tell them that I was the most spiritual man under the sun, just struggling with everybody else. But I was dry. The nearest thing I ever get to direct words from the Lord was <laughs> just the awareness that no matter where I was turning, I was turning to the wrong place, I had to go back and read the scriptures. I just had that deep awareness in my heart that I think was the Holy Spirit saying, hey, there's only one place you can get nourished. So three nights in a row, I ended up just taking my Bible for an hour and working through a section in Romans 6, 7, and 8, grappling with the issue of what it means to live according to the Spirit in anticipation of doing some preaching at Trinity. So you're going to get some sermons on living in the Spirit. Well, the point I'm making is this. I was only in that work about 10 minutes, and I had a clipboard, and I was doing mechanical layouts of Scripture. My mind was active, and so but as I began to grapple with that material, it came alive in a way that's not simply intellectual interest. Something else happened in the depths of my being, and I knew that I was being fed in my very spirit, my inmost being. Something was happening that was much more than just the head. It was coming through the head, coming through the head, but there was light. All the same, I was seeing light in little things. Just a little thing like this. Uh, about those who live according to the Spirit. And it's just a little, just all flashed with light and joy and certainty. I'll tell you what. I didn't care what anybody said to me that moment. I would have said, these words are the words of God. This doesn't happen when I read Louis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology or John Calvin. That's it doesn't happen. There's only one place this happens. This happens in the scriptures. There is a self-authenticating power. Now, I think, and this is the point that this is making, our full persuasion and assurance that the infallible truth of the scriptures, not because mum and dad told us all our lives, in the end, full persuasion, full persuasion and assurance comes from the inward work of the spirit who witnesses by and with that word in our hearts. Something profound happens. And as a result of that, although there are parts of the scriptures that I read at times and I shake my head and say, can that in the world be true? I mean, just from the mind I say that. Yet I don't doubt for a moment that these words are the word of God. And the reason I don't doubt is because I've been able to put everything through a grid of scientific analysis and come up with a reasonably satisfying conclusion. The reason I accept that as the word of God is because God has borne witness in my heart through and with that word that this is his word. Nothing else does it that way. So that's the ultimate ground. Even though there are other good evidences out there to support the idea, final and full assurance this is God's word found that way. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but I say hallelujah to that, and I'm Amen. delighted and, uh, and thrilled with that, that you don't have to be a genius. You don't even just have dominating parents like Catherine Scott. <laughs> no. In the end, what will convince you above everything else is God's word, is him speaking to you through it. Simple as that. And that will enable you to take that blessed book and say, look, even though I, this, this, this seems a bit crazy to me and I don't understand it, I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Because I trust the book. Not because it satisfied my intellectual capacity. Is that all right? So I think that's an interesting, a very, very interesting point here. Um, let's just look at the last little quotation we've got right down the bottom here of your page seven. Robert Shaw, who's one of the 
early Scottish writers on the confession of faith says this, though many who believe, who are Christians in other words, are not qualified to demonstrate the inspiration of the scriptures by rational arguments, yet by the experience they have of their power and efficacy in their own hearts, or on their own hearts, they are infallibly assured that they are the word of God. Got that? Though there are many that don't have the rational ability. You remember that blind man that had been healed and was summoned before the Sanhedrin? And they said, who made you well? And he says, well, it was Jesus made us well. And he says, that man's a liar. He could never do it. And they got into a real argument, a logical argument about this, this man, as it were. What did that blind man say in the end? He says, yeah, well, he says, whether it's possible for this, that he says, I don't have a clue. But one thing I do know, once I was blind, now I see. And although that may seem incredibly irrational in our modern world, that is the essence of my and our final assurance that that word is the word of God. The spirit taking his word and working in your own heart such an infallible conviction and assurance and certainly like nothing else. This is God's word. And you can stand and you like that blind man. Well, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Let me just mention this last thing. I shouldn't say this perhaps with Catherine here, but anyway, Catherine, you should block your ears at this little bit. <laughs> when Nola and I got engaged, Nola's mum and dad were a bit concerned about this flaming redhead who <laughs> believed in the Westminster Confession of Faith, it was flaming red, and that, well it was redder than it is now, who believed in the Westminster Confession of Faith and so on, and they arranged for us to go and see one of their older trusted ministers, ranked liberal. And uh, he, when we went to see him, he asked us lots of questions. He says, what do you think of the documentary hypothesis? And I said, what? <laughs> JPD. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. And he asked all these sorts of questions, you see, about these technical, critical issues with regard to the scriptures and their authority. I was just like, I mean, from one point of view, I felt absolutely battered. I thought, I don't know anything. But in my heart and soul, one thing I did know. That is, once I was blind, but now I could see. I really knew that, and he couldn't take that away from me. Now, last thing, or absolute last thing I will say in this, this does have some implications, I think, for evangelism. You can, and an evidentialist approach to evangelism will try and use these things, the indicia, to try and argue people into a belief that the scriptures are trustworthy and authoritative. And I'm not saying there's no value in that, but unless the Spirit of God is at work in the hearts of those people, you'll never convince them. You'll never, ever convince them. They'll say, your arguments are circular. And they'll come back to me. I always appreciate what Jim Peterson says in um, his book, Living Proof, which is basically this in evangelism. He found that an apologetic pre-evangelism in which you try and convince people of the authority of the scriptures is seldom ever any use in evangelism. Best thing to do is put the potent book in their hands and get them to begin reading it or reading it with you and it will do its own work in that self-authenticating way. And I'm inclined to agree with that in terms of an apologetic thrust or it's certainly my predominant way. I say, well, people, I would say unequivocally myself, I believe this is God's word. But I can't convince somebody by rational argument of that in the end. In the end, even though I give them all these things, here I am, I can attest to its value, I can talk about its features which point to it being the word of God, but in the end, the only thing that's going to convince it is when the spirit of God opens their eyes and they see those qualities in it themselves and they experience the transforming power of that doctrine in their lives. The efficacy of the doctrine felt and experienced in their own lives. That in the end is what convinces people. This is the word of God.
and they will venture out into areas that they don't know scholarly trusting because they believe it's God's word even though they can't understand it all is that fair enough? so that's where we're up to tonight how do we know? how can we know about God? because God has spoken yeah he's spoken in what he's done but he's spoken also and revealed himself in different times and ways he's inscripturated that word that word is defined in a group of books the church calls the canon of scripture 66 books they are inspired books distinct from apocryphal and other books which are not inspired and don't have that feature. How can we be sure that they are God's word? Well, not because a man tells you so, but because they are God's word. How will we know that? Not just by external evidences, but ultimately we're going to know it by the testimony of the Spirit working with that word. That's the critical thing. That will keep you from false mystical ways. Fresh words come saying, God told me it was his word. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that word. Heard, read, and listened to under the preaching of the word. Doing something in our souls. And when we hear spirit-filled preaching, I think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. We know God himself speaking to us through his word. And you don't need any man to tell you. You don't even need to try and prove that. There is an innate authority and character of divinity about that word that you know. And you put your hands up and say, I'm going to stop fighting. God's self-attesting word. Okay, happy enough? Sorry to be late. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Let's do that. Our Heavenly Father. We do really thank you that you have not left us in our ignorance and rebellion, but you've spoken, preserved your word, and that we can be sure that it is your living word. We pray that we go away not simply with these ideas in our minds, but with a fresh commitment to listen to your voice. How we long for the efficacy of your word to be experienced in our own lives, lifting us to the heavens, Warming, thrilling, assuring, changing us, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by thy truth. Thy word is truth. O oh Lord, hear our prayer, for we ask it for your glory and because our souls desperately need it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I hope that we've got the wheels moving at last and we'll get into it. Next week we'll look at things like sufficiency, we'll look at translations.